I would know, you know, the ins and outs of if I had to look after a baby for 20 minutes, for example, (laughs) not a whole day though. Um, But also I think a lot of guidance and the pressure of having to learn a lot of these things by yourself and figure things out versus uh, looking up to someone and having someone to follow. But in saying that, I think um, it has helped me grow up a lot quicker and be able to do a lot of things on my own. Before we get started on today's episode, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this podcast is recorded, the land of the Darug people. We would like to acknowledge and pay respects to our elders past and present and the next generation coming through. Now on to today's episode. Today, we've got a special episode where we discuss topics from our own experiences as Asian Australian women. We deep dive into the discussions around the challenges of being an eldest daughter, societal and peer pressures when it comes to beauty standards, and the ongoing debate around choosing a career versus having kids, and whether or not you should tell your boss about the situation. Can, Davy, and Noel, who are each business owners, also weigh in from their perspectives? Enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Level Asian podcast. We've got a special edition where we're talking about Asian female topics. I'd like to introduce Michelle. Hello, everyone. She's normally behind the camera, which you would have seen in some videos. And then we've also got Kelsey. Hello, hello. Um, Kelsey does all of our editing, so she's behind the scenes as well. So all of our episode pillars and all of our content, you would have seen um, Kelsey is the one creating that. Myself, Vivian, you would have seen me before and heard my voice before. And then we've also got a different perspective here today, Noel. So he's our male perspective in this, but he's also coming from a different lens. I'm here because I apparently have a soft boy energy. So. <laughs> We're keeping the filter clean today. He's also the guy that gets friend zoned a lot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's true. That's true. <laughs> um, we did an Instagram uh, questionnaire for everyone on our Instagram, and we took a lot of submissions of what you guys wanted to hear in this podcast episode too. We got inundated with a lot of submissions, and a lot of them were around. Um, Women beauty standards, ageism, a lot of people asking for career advice or just career perspectives in terms of, I guess they just want to hear other people's experiences around that, as well as um, having children is one of the big things. So motherhood versus chasing career. And then we've also got a lot of submissions around being the eldest daughter. So experiences around that or struggles, as well as growing up with one of the submissions was growing up as an only girl with brothers which is Kelsey's experience, actually. We've got a lot of topics to cover today, but let's start from, I think the best way would be to go through different topics um, and unpack all of them and hear all of our experiences and what our takes are. So let's get started with, hmm. Eldest daughter. (laughs) Eldest daughter. Let's go straight to that. heaviest (laughs) one. Yep. Okay. So Michelle, I don't actually, I've never asked you before. So what is your family dynamic like i've got an older brother and we're like three years apart um when we were young i think we were quite close because like i was pretty tomboyish like we would play games together like nintendo um nintendo 360 64 64. yeah 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 so we would do that we'll play like mario kart and then i think it was like in high school that we started like drifting apart a little bit because it's obviously like we just get, yeah, it just gets a little bit different. And now it's just more like he only texts me because he moved out. He only texts me when he wants to like um, see my dog. He's like, can you send oh. me a picture of, of, of Ellie? And I'm like, fine. I just send him a photo and that's it. <laughs> yeah, I'm the youngest in my in my family. I think I would say, yeah, I got, I got a lot of love because I'm like the only daughter. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Kelsey? I am the eldest daughter. I have two younger brothers. And yeah, I think being the eldest daughter comes with a lot of exclusive trauma, I'd say. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, I am also eldest daughter. I have two younger siblings, one female, one male. Um, My brother is the youngest of them all. And yeah, I think agree with Kelsey. There are a lot of things that we could unpack and there is a lot of unique experiences being the eldest daughter. Um, And not a lot of people talk about it, but I think it's a collective Collective experience with other eldest daughters. Uh, Noel? Uh, Only child, single mother, no sisters. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so not a lot to go off. Um, But look, I think, uh, yeah, being being raised by a single mother is also, I think, a very different experience. I didn't have a typical stoic Asian male dad presence in my life. I think I had a lot of more feminine energy and more nurturing kind of um, upbringing, which um, I think, you know, benefited me a lot. 
Um, and I also think like grow like working in the creative industry, like post uni, um, a lot of my mentors are female. Like I think, you know, the, the arts is typically more dominated by females, <laughs> the one industry that is. Um, so yeah, I think I had a lot of strong female influences in my life. So that's definitely kind of shaped me as a person now. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess maybe we'll touch on both of our experiences. So the types of pressures that we would face, I'm sure a lot of other people face a lot of your Asian parent expectations tend to fall on you first before it gets trickled over to the other siblings, especially if, say, you are the female eldest daughter and then you've got, for example, younger brothers. Mm -hmm. There may not be the same uh, expectations placed on you versus them. Have you found that be the case? Yes. (laughs) In what way? Can you touch on your experience? Um, Not that my parents ever verbalized all these pressuring things on me, but it was just there. It just hangs on you. And you, in a way, you're kind of like a third parent too. Like my mom would always say to me when I was like in primary school, oh, make sure your brothers are doing this. Make sure they're like, okay. Like, oh, can you do this for them? Help them with their homework. Like, why can't you do it, mom? You're the parent, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, you know, I've kind of just rolled with it and it's, you know, just become a part of my identity in a way as well. Um, I guess I can relate with that. Uh, Same with my parents. I grew up helping raise my siblings just because my parents were immigrant parents and they were working all the time. And so a lot of the time I was left at home with my siblings when they were a lot younger. So, you know, during the week, school holidays, um, there is quite a big age gap between myself and my siblings. And so a lot of the times I was changing nappies or cooking for them, but you know, it has taught me a lot of life skills that I am able to carry on now. Like I can cook now. I can cook for myself. I can look after myself. I would know, you know, the ins and outs of if I had to look after a baby for 20 minutes, for example, (laughs) not a whole day though. Um, But also I think a lot of guidance and the pressure of having to learn a lot of these things by yourself and figure things out versus uh, looking up to someone and having someone to follow. But in saying that, I think um, it has helped me grow up a lot quicker and be able to do a lot of things on my own. Um, But I guess being an eldest child as well, I think I do worry about my siblings and uh, them not being able to do certain things. Um, But yeah, that's kind of my experience in a nutshell. Do you mean not being able to do certain things because they've been spoiled or? I think yes, but also, so for my brother, for example, he's, he's kind of been thrown in more of the deep end of, you know, he has to cook for himself or he has to do certain things. Uh, My sister, but she's, because she's been sandwiched between the two of us, you know, either one of us will be the one cooking and she doesn't necessarily have to do that or has has had to grow up doing that as well as I guess little life things. Um, you know, she'll always call my mum or call me to come pick her up. Uh, that is the first point of contact first. Whereas for me, it's like I always have to drive myself around, which is nice because you get the freedom of doing that. Or I, I, my first instinct wouldn't be to call my parents and pick me up. My first instinct would be like, check public transport, check cars, whatever. So I think also being the eldest and the daughter means that you're kind of, well, your parents are a lot more stricter on you than your siblings. A hundred percent. I think I am uh, speaking from my experience recently, my siblings are getting older. So for example, my sister is just turned 18 and my brother has just turned 15. So I am seeing a lot of things that I never got to do until I was, you know, early twenties. I'm still in my early twenties. And so, you know, they get to go out until 10 PM, 11 PM parties every weekend. Whereas for me, it was a strict 8 PM. You must be home. Otherwise they'll come find me wherever I am. Um, can't do certain things. Like I got I wasn't able to get my ears pierced until I was 18, but my brother just turned up the other day with both his ears pierced. Uh, my brother's gone on sleepovers before. I haven't been able to do sleepovers, stuff like that. So I think the expectation is very, very different. And uh, if I bring it up to my mom, it's very like, no, I didn't. I didn't do that to you. What do you mean? Blah, blah, blah. Like I treated you very fairly and whatnot. Or it's the other side of your siblings don't listen to me, but you do listen to me. What about you, Kels? I feel like my parents were a lot more fair in comparison to your upbringing. (laughs) (laughs) Say it how it is. There was that atmosphere of like pressure to kind of lead and pave the way for Mm. my siblings. Um, So yeah, like academically, especially from my mother, even though she's the white counterpart of me, to be honest. Um, I think because her own 
upbringing, she didn't get that guidance from her own grand or my grandparents. So I guess that translates into why she was very critical of me mm. <laughs> growing mm-hmm. up. Yeah. Do you guys kind of feel like you were the experiment children? Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Like my youngest brother, like he gets away with everything. Yeah. Like if I was to do that, oh my God, back end. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> On the other hand, Michelle, though, you've got an older brother. So did you feel like uh, you could get a lot of, uh, get away with a lot of stuff or you got to watch your brother um, cop a lot of stuff and you got to get away, I guess you got it easier. Like to an extent, I think I did get it a little bit easier, but for example, like even just like going to uni and wanting to study a specific degree, I think that was still applied the same. Like my, my parents would be like, um, to my brother, it's got to be either like, you know, finance or, you know, commerce in that area or business. And then for me as well, it'll be like a specific profession. Like they wanted me to do like early childhood or like be a primary school teacher because- Interesting. Yeah, because it was like, um, it was stable. It was considered stable back at like 10 years ago. It's like teachers would be quite as respected. But um, yeah, it was a stable job. Um, you could do it for a really long time. Um, you get some good benefits and yeah, you get holidays as well. So yeah, I think um, they wanted me to do that too. Um, but then, you know, I went on a completely different path. So, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> All right. So we've covered family dynamics, but let's mm-hmm. talk about families and raising families themselves. Um, what I'm interested in is because both of you guys are the eldest daughter and you've mm-hmm. had to look after your younger siblings. Um, obviously, you've had to take a maternal role at a younger age. Mm-hmm. Um, did that impact your decision to want to have kids or not? This is very interesting. Mm. I want to I want to hear your thoughts because I have heard from a lot of people that the oldest daughter chooses. It's either 50-50. They really, really, really want to have kids or they, they are completely turned off kids entirely. I'm kind of stuck in a limbo, to be honest. Like, I'm not against it, but currently right now in this moment, I'd rather just not have kids. Like, mm-hmm. I'd rather like focus all my energy into things I want to do mm-hmm. as selfish as that sounds um but yeah you know if I meet someone and they change my mind well then you know so be it hmm, interesting I personally until very recently I grew up never wanting to have kids and I voiced that with my parents very early on uh, I actually had the conversation with my mom and dad the other day and I was like I don't actually want to have kids because they were mentioning you know Oh, you know, when you're you're older, you need to have kids so that they can look after you. And I said, no, that's not happening. I'm not getting married until I'm past 30. I'm not having kids. I have a superannuation account, so yeah. <laughs> I'll be okay. <laughs> exactly. Um, I guess my experience growing up having to look after younger kids and um, feeling like another parent already, I think it's not deterred my decision, but I think I'm just okay to grow up and focus on myself and do the things that I want to do, like go on holidays. Um, Not to say that having a kid later on isn't on the cards, but personally right now, it's very, very distant. Would you rather be the cool aunt? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You get to treat your (laughs) nieces and nephews to holidays and chocolates and everything. You get all the fun experience of children without dealing with like the tantrums. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, nice. Mish, what about you? Look, I think I'm at a bit of an awkward age now because it's not like I'm like above 25 now so heading into the 30s so I'm not really young but I'm not really old either and I think for like women at this awkward age they feel a little bit of a haste Mm. because it seems like 30 is like a cutoff line or the you, clock's ticking right yeah like it seems like it's like oh i have to get everything ready before 30 i need the house i need you know a i husband. need to have a husband or i needed to do i needed to travel all these different places and well because of covid as well like kind of we kind of like lost two or, or three years of our life and i'm just like oh my gosh I'll be 30 really soon, you know? So yeah, there's that sense of like desperation. It's kind of like, I need to do a lot of these things. Um, And I think I think a lot of that, it does come from peer pressure as well. When you see your friends kind of like start to get married and have kids and you see that and, and it's like, oh, I think I want to have that kind of life. But at the same time, it's like, is it possible to have that kind of life, but then have your career as well? Because I think a lot of the times women do sacrifice a lot of their career and their passion for their kids. Like my mom, she used to work at Woody Bank, Woody and Inc., which is kind of like, it's kind of like Combank or NAB or Westpac. So it's a pretty big company. Um, and But then she, when she had uh, my brother, 
yeah, she she completely had to quit and then she became a full domestic housewife. And then I kind of look at that and go, yeah, back in that day, they probably didn't have maternity leave or anything like that. So it was a given that as soon as you have a kid, women that, you know, they quit their they quit their passion, they quit their career and then, you know, they just ra- raise their kids. And I look at that and go, I think she's sacrificed a lot. And for me to have a kid as well, that means like I might have to also sacrifice a lot of my free time, um, even my career as well. Because if, if, if your career is not like um, doesn't have a lot of work life balance, then it's going to be hard. Yeah. Um, like I know a lot of like female wedding photographers, like they, they have, would have a kid and then a month or two later, they, they would be out shooting. And that, that, when I see that, I go, wow, that's, that's a lot. Yeah. I think I'm in a bit of a limbo as well. If you for me personally. Yeah. And I reckon like being able to see our mums or our parents grow up and sacrifice so much too, um, gives us a taste of, maybe I don't want kids because I do want to enjoy a life that they maybe never got to have. I I can agree with, um, or my experience with my mom too, touching on that. Like my mom wanted to do Chinese medicine her whole life. And I remember when I was living up, uh, living in Wagga. So before I moved to Sydney, she would take me on car rides to visit Sydney, to visit the Chinese school of medicine here. And that was, I knew that that was her dream, but she never got to do that because she had me and then she had my two siblings. She was helping my dad with the business and she gave that life up. And so it wasn't until very recently when I was going through university. So a few years ago, she decided to enroll in Chinese medicine school and finally be able to live that dream out. And she still did it part time. She still did three days a week. She would drive all the way to North Sydney just to do clinic. Um, she would go to the city all the time in between having to rush home and cook dinner for all of us. And seeing that makes me think of I want to be able to fulfill everything I feel like I don't want to miss out on or want to achieve before I can bring someone else in or I never want to hold any sort of resentment or underlying resentment for that. Yeah, so I think, you know, Mitch mentioned approaching 30 and I think because both of you guys are under 25, you Mm. might not feel that same amount of pressure, but, you know, 26, 27 is approaching. Do you think your, your perspective will change as you're approaching 30? Potentially, like I'm 25 this year and I'm kind of slowly starting to feel it a bit. I don't know about you. I think, yeah, I don't I don't think women ever get to an age where it's like, oh, 26, 27, that's when I'm going to start thinking about having kids. I think it's very, you grow up with it like in primary school, for example, it's always, can you draw your family and can you draw how many kids you would like to have? Or what would you like to do when you're older? Do you, like, what does your family look like? And I think you just grow up with the whole expectation that you are going to have kids one day and how you're going to manage that. And that's your role entirely. Uh, For me personally, I've already started thinking about if I do want to have a kid within my, you know, mid thirties or late thirties, it means that I would have to start planting the seeds now. Like Michelle said, you, you want to get a house ready or you want to be able to have your own nest and you want to have a partner you can settle down with, a stable life. And that doesn't just happen in one or two years. You know, when, yep. you, when you turn 27, 28 is around the corner. How can you get a house or a husband or a ring in that time? Yeah, it's, I think women also carry that mental load around their whole lives. And so the clock is always feeling like it's ticking. Even if you decide that you don't want to have kids, you still have this looming feeling of, that's what my purpose is. And if I did decide to have kids, I need to do it soon. I think biologically too, like our bodies are like amping us up to have a kid. So that doesn't help too. Hmm. Yeah. No, I think it's as guys, like we definitely don't have the same amount of pressure. And I think we have to acknowledge that privilege that we have. Like, and you know, I think you could be, you could be a late, you could be an older father. Like you can have kids in your forties if you really wanted to. And that's not uncommon. And a lot of the time you see relationships where, yeah, like 10 year gaps between the male and female. And it's not too much of a, there's not too much pressure from family and there's not too much societal expectation. And I think you don't have the same pressure to give up career or choose between career and family. Um, you don't have to make the same sacrifices or it's not expected. Um, not to say that there aren't any stay at home dads out there. And I think, you know, if you choose to be, that's fantastic. Um, but you just don't see too much of that around just yet. Yeah. I think that's a good point to talk about too, because we had a lot of people um, asking us to discuss, uh, should we be choosing motherhood or should we be choosing career? And especially when you're in your late twenties or your early thirties, that's you know a very important point of where you want to take your career or your profession. And that's usually, you know, usually where you are starting to settle down or get comfortable or move your way up. Um, 
and you know if, even if you're changing career that's that's usually the point that it happens right and so I guess if you were to have a kid do you feel like you would be able to work at the same time or do you think you would have to give up a lot of your time and your career to be able to pursue being a mum or is there a balance of being able to be yourself but you're also a mum at the same time I think there are a lot more jobs these days that gives you that flexibility mm. though. Whereas like before it would be like completely like you'd be a full-time um, housewife. Now I think it's more like companies are giving like a lot of maternity, maternity leave. So like I worked at a university and the benefits were amazing, right? So um, we'd have the marketing team, there would be like several teams in there. And then there was this one specific team like they were all women right and each woman each girls like they would go on a maternity leave like every three months and then you'd see like a new chick popping up and a new chick popping up and it's just like because they're covering for it you know mm. and I'm like what the hell and then we would used to like kind of like joke around and call it like a pregnancy room like that that team is just like they're always <laughs> giving birth you know that's <laughs> Davey's experience right now well, as you guys are talking like this and I'm like oh we're gonna currently go through this in uh next year because like everyone's we're, we're going through the phase where everyone's slowly getting married right now so yeah we've got like six uh girls in our um in our team and every one of them is getting married slowly and then eventually everyone was going to get, pop out a kid. But for me, I have to admit, like, I love it. Like, I as, as the boss, I'm like, I love, I want to see them grow with, it, with the company. And, like, for me, it's the business is a family. And I want to see you and your family prosper. So, and exactly what you said, um, which is, I think uh, right now, uh, there is no stigma that you, you have to choose career um over you know having kids i think that like most businesses are starting to go you know go have your family and but you know we'll we'll, we'll plan it we'll plan it we'll work it out you know it's not the end of the world we can just find a replacement for the time being or i just do a bit of extra work and then eventually you know you're back i do want to touch on the fact though that can noel davy are all business owners but we are also all very fortunate to be in such an inclusive and um I guess, open-minded workplace, right? Whereas if we took this to corporate, I know a lot of women feel like they aren't allowed to um, have kids. So for example, there's a big talk around, you shouldn't ever mention that you want to have kids in the future, especially when you're having a job interview or you're getting promoted, or you shouldn't be talking about that in your personal life because word gets around and people choose not to promote you because of that, because then you're going to be taking maternity leave and they have to find someone else. So what's your opinion on that? And I guess I know you, I'm putting you guys on the spot, but like, how do you feel about that? And do you think there should be a change to allow females to feel more included or how do we, how do, how do we adjust that conversation or start that conversation in corporate, especially? I'm probably not the best person to ask because I have zero corporate experience. <laughs> I've been a freelancer and then a business owner. So yeah, not a lot, but um, I think Davey, you know, I think you have quite a bit of extensive corporate experience in and you can. can. Yeah. So what do you guys think? Well, first things first, you're hundred percent right. Um, in corporate world, it's a lot more harder. I do remember I was interviewing, um, you know, some candidates and I believe one of the partners were trying to figure out if, um, you know, they're planning to, uh, have a kid or not, just to work out like the plans for the future. I don't think that was like, I, I think personally, it, they didn't say anything. Um, it was just an internal meeting and it's it's not, definitely not something that's nice at all. I feel like it's, there's so much pressure. So it's like, I can tell that females are less likely wanting to talk about that when having the interviews. And that's, yeah, it's not, not really great at all. So. I think the best way around that is just to be honest and tell them because you don't want to be working at a place like that anyway, right? So you've got to find the industries and the corporate companies that, you know, are okay with, you know, you going on maternity leave or okay with the dad goes on maternity leave because there's plenty of companies out there that do that now. Yeah, heaps of them. Mm. Yeah. Ken? Oh, no, for me, it's a little bit different because... Um, like I'm just thinking back now to Cassie, our general manager, and when she told, she actually told me that she was pregnant within her first trimester, which is not something you normally do because you know there's a lot of uncertainty. It's very risky, um, but she felt safe to share that with me. Um, 
I don't think I deliberately did anything to promote that. I think uh, when I worked in corporate, there was a lot of maternity leave. So it just became a very normal thing for me. Um, and so I, I was very, um, I was very grateful that she actually shared it because it allowed us more time to plan for this sort of stuff. And I think whether it's corporate or business owners, because I don't think it's exclusive to corporate. I feel like there are business owners out there that are the same. You have this issue of thinking that it's more like a nuisance, like it's a, it's a, it's, it's, um, it's bothersome because you have to replace the person and it's temporary and then it just like disrupts your whole business. But I think um, people need to understand that this is just like, it's just fact of life, like it will happen. And I think now that partners are also taking extended time, I know so many people's husbands, for example, partners are also taking like six to eight months off. It's like a normal thing. So it's not exclusive to females. And then um, now recently my wife having a kid, that gave me a newfound appreciation for how hard it is for um, females to decide between these things. And then the process of like, cause think about it. It's like, it's one thing to tell your boss that you're going to be pregnant, but then like to go through nine months of being pregnant, then having the kid, popping the kid out and then looking after the kid for the rest of your life. Um, it's a lot of pressure. So I have more empathy, but I think a lot of people don't, I don't know for one reason or another. And oftentimes it, it, it I think it boils down to just a lack of either empathy or just, selfish yeah um so yeah yeah and then i also want to add as well um just advice on what you should do like it's important to not over promise and under deliver as well like you know you're, you're planning to have a kid in the next year or so i think you should just be transparent about that and tell them or you already have a kid and you've got to take days off because there's no point trying to make it work and then putting stress on your family as well as putting stress on, at work and it's not working at all so as a business owner, what would you want to hear or how would you be able to, I guess when people have these conversations um, with their bosses or with higher ups, they don't know how to start the conversation or what you guys want to hear and what transparent means. So what do you mean by that? Oh, okay. So I believe like during the interview process, if it's the interview, they just told me up front. Like well, I've hired um, a lot of emails that were, well, so not a lot of emails, but I've hired one um, person that started with me and she just had a newborn. And she says, I only can work from home. And I was like, yeah, that's fine. Um, but just so you know, like these are the set hours. Can you do the 40 hours? If you can do the 40 hours, it's fine. If you can't do the 40 hours, then let me know. Like you got to let me know earlier um, because there's no point trying to overpromise this and then um, you're going to under deliver and then we're going to have to hire you and then have them to let you go because it's not going to work. So we made that clear at the start and we're trying to figure it out. And even if they can't, even if they, they promised it and it's not working, they have to constantly update. So we ask them how they're going, how is um, how's things at home. And I, I actively promote that. I actually say that to my staff all the time. It's like, let me know how you're going in your family. Like, you know, if you think something's going on with your family and it might impact work, just let us know. It's okay. You don't have to tell me the full story. You just got to tell me that things are going on and I, I think I might need some time or I might need, I um, may or may not, I'll let you know in a week and that will help like, so we can plan. I think the most yeah. important thing is that we just need to plan around it. Yeah. And like we have families ourselves, we're planning to have families. So we totally understand that you can't always know what's going on, but as long as you give us enough notice, we can try to figure it out. The, the worst is not, giving us notice it's not the thing that happens it's the lack of notice um because we don't have a solution then um mm. so but that's the, we're different like i feel like in a lot of ways there are a lot of probably bosses and stuff who you know don't provide that level of um you know i guess uh, empathy again so i think for us it's just communication we just understand it is what it is um but you know like i think a lot of people feel like they have to have their shit together by the time they talk to their bosses when in actual fact what you should do is work with your boss or work with your manager to figure out what the best plan is. Like that's at least in my eyes as well, how you should do it. It's almost like you, you lay out your boundaries that you think are realistic and then you work around them and then also make sure that there's really high level of communication too. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. But also don't abuse it. Right. <laughs> like, yeah, like if some people out there, they just try to abuse it and that's what causes significant issues. Like, um, you don't, you, like if you care for your, your family, I think, and you're always spending so much time at work, you should care for work as well. It's important because that, in turn, ha in caring about work, you, work will care for your family because that's how you, you depend on work to be able to care for your family. So why not treat work 
just as important as family. Like you can't just go, family is the most important and just drop work because you need work to, to look after your family. That's what I think. Yeah, there's an interdependence. Yeah. Yeah. And I think yeah. that in Australia, especially because it's so bloody hard to um, survive without, you know, having um, both parties, uh, both husband and wife or both partners working. Yeah, it's definitely tough. I think um, you can have probably have the best of both worlds if you have a really good support system. Like if you have parents that are happy to take care of kids during school holidays, for example. Um, if you don't, then it can be a bit challenging. Mm. I mean, I was, I mean, you know, my mom had me unexpectedly. Um, she still hadn't, you know, finished college, like university. So from my infancy to I was like five, my grandparents raised me. So we were like really lucky in that she had that support and she can go live her own life and focus on a career and, you know, get educated and all of that. Um, but coming here to Australia when it was just us two, uh, we didn't have any other kind of support network. So we kind of had to make it work in a way where, you know, she'd be working, you know, six days, like a lot of overtime as well. And so I would be at home by myself a lot, which was probably not legal, but my good parents, you got to do it. Um, so it kind of does impact your kids in a way where it's like, you know, you can have the job and you need the job to kind of support your family. But at the same time, it also means if you don't have the support, it's taking a lot of time away from that family time as well, which is also really important. Yeah, everyone's experiences are very different, but I guess just keeping in mind whatever situation you're in, there's always going to be a workaround if you have the environment to do so, but also are able to openly communicate that too. But there be, there's going to be situations where the, your boss or your manager is a dick. Mm-hmm. In which case you don't bother, like you don't you don't fight a battle that you're going to lose eventually. Um, so you, there's a level of um, discretion or judgment that you have to make whether or not someone that you feel you can have a good conversation with or you don't. The problem is there's probably more of um, the negative than there is the positive at the moment for a lot of females. And so then there's this whole stigma around being careful about what you say. I guess the other option is like, you know, a lot of female entrepreneurs who instead of kind of sticking in the corporate world kind of do their own business where they can kind of call the shots, call the shots around their, their own schedule um, and make their work life work around their family life as well. So I think there's that option as well. Um, obviously it's a bit of, it's a lot of work starting a business as we all know, but you know, I think in this day and age um, given all the kind of resources and ideas and technology that we have, like, you know, that is also another like you don't really have to stick to corporate if you don't have to, like if you don't want to. If you don't want to make it work or can't seem to make it work there, there are, you can kind of think outside the box and come up with another solution. I think we can speak from, I guess, a point of privilege though because we do have that experience of being out of corporate whereas some people only grow up with parents who have been in corporate or their siblings as well as themselves and that's the only path they know how to walk and they don't actually know how to break out of it or know it might feel really scary to them because they don't know the other side of it, right? Mm. Um, I guess, do we have any uh, advice from you guys of how they can do that or how to navigate a hard to deal with boss? Yeah, to be honest, like there's a lot of bosses out there and there's a lot of companies. Like you don't have to stick with one, right? There's just so many of them out there. Sometimes, like, and I always say this to like, whether you're a female or whether you're a male in a business, like sometimes you get dealt the wrong cards and you get a manager or a boss that is terrible. Maybe uh, they will be better in five years time, but at that point in time, they're just not a good manager or they're going through something like themselves. So they just don't understand. So it's like, it's not a good time. You gotta, I think it's a good idea for you to move on and find someone else that's, you know, better. Um, I know you've been with that company for a very long time or you have loyalty to that company or that was the, your dream job. But to be honest, it's not good for your mental health and it's also not, good for your family. So find something that's just more um, easy on your family or just will give you a better pathway. Um, because there's so many businesses and jobs out there for, you know, female um, uh, industries. So, uh, well, sorry, female um, uh, workers. So I don't think it's a big that deal. Um, one thing I do want to mention, I don't know if you guys want to add to, uh, you know, your career, but I feel like it's not just the job that gives a lot of pressure. It's the guilt as well mm-hmm. of being away um, and working while you know you know sending your kid to um, you know to live with your parents or your parents mm-hmm. tenure. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm interested to hear that type of um, 
uh, opinion as well from you guys. This episode is produced and brought to you by Social Wave. Social Wave is a strategic content marketing agency helping businesses grow revenue using video, podcasts, and SEO. Head on over to socialwave.com.au to find out more. Now back to the show. I, I think a lot of women spend a lot of time thinking about their plan early on because of that guilt playing in because they don't know what other options they're going to have. We have to think of every single scenario possible. So for example, if we went and took maternity leave, before we even do that, we are thinking about how long am I going to take off um, after I've given birth? Who's going to look after the kid? Or um, how am I going to go back to work? What am I going to tell my boss? Uh, am I going to be able to stay at home? Can I afford childcare? You know, stuff like that's really expensive. Is my partner going to work full time? Is he going to be able to him, he or she able to stay home and look after me as well? You know, there's just so many factors and mental load uh, aspects to think about. Do, do you guys, uh, like, so the thing is, actually, I spoke to my missus about this thing. I actually think that she feels guilty about it. Like, and because like she wants to still enjoy her life and she feels like she, one, yes, she sacrifices, but even if she doesn't sacrifice, she feels like that she's not giving her 100% to her kid and that's the expectation you know when you become a mom right you have like and that's our parents our parents did that they gave 100% they quit their job they quit their career to focus on their um, their kids and like you know I think it's important for the men to step in like just you know to say that hey um you know we're going to provide for the family so you can mm-hmm. give as much give as permission you yeah. yeah give them permission mm-hmm. and like I, I don't now that I think about it, I don't think I do it enough. Here. Actually, I'm curious. If it was the other way around and you have children with your partner and your partner's like, you know what, I'm very career driven and I want to really focus on my career, how would you feel about being the stay at home father? Not thinking straight, but I think I would love it. Like, I personally feel like I'm <laughs> Definitely not thinking straight. <laughs> it's fucking hard. <laughs> it's also hard to run a business where, like, it's, it's harder hard. to look after a kid than running a business. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, oh. Yeah, yeah. So I never had a kid, yeah. so I wouldn't know. Yeah. Um, but I also feel like I would absolutely enjoy it so much, like being able to, you know, look, be there for my family. Yeah. And you guys know that, like you guys actually see it when I talk about my family and how much I do for my family already. It like, yes, it, I feel very guilty, but it brings me so much joy as well. So I think I would absolutely enjoy it as well. And that's the thing that mums talk about. They talk about like, and, and my dads, don't forget about the dads, but the mums talk about like how much joy it gives them. So I think the that saying where it's like you won't know until you have it really means a lot. And I don't know yet, but I, I always see people have this like spark in their eyes when I talk to them and I can't wait to have that spark. But it's the other thing of like identity too. Um, you, I think there's a big conversation around women having an identity of being a mother or getting to be themselves, which I think can maybe you can touch on in terms of Iris um she's just recently you guys have just recently had a baby um, i think yeah i mentioned this a few times in different podcast episodes she originally didn't want kids because she wanted to enjoy her life and um you know this plays in all the asian dynamics around how she has to look after parents when they get old and she just hasn't had an opportunity to really enjoy her life for an extended period of time and then recently she changed her mind partly because i think um, there's lots of influencing factors but one of them was really just around like hey um like having a she she sort of associated having a kid with like the end of her independence like she her whole identity changes and she and then i think she came to the realization that it wasn't just that it was like you just add another layer on so i think it's not binary for her it was more like it started out thinking it was this or that but instead now it's like okay i am this but then i also now am a mother as well and yes, it probably puts a dent into your plans because right now we want to travel and stuff like that. Like everyone's like everyone's traveling right now and like we can't travel because he's two months old and you know, he can't do anything. He just eats and sleeps and shits. And so so then it's like the, the whole notion of like saying, right, like you can have your cake and eat it too, but maybe at times you have to make compromises as well. Um, and so I think society teaches females a lot about having to, it's like, it's either this or that forever. When in actual fact, the reality is it's not, it's, there's, you can, you can definitely play into more. Cause one of the things that came to mind that I wanted to ask was, um, if you're someone who's like, if you're a female who's very career driven, um, one of the things I hear a lot is like, oh, I go away. I have kids. I have a couple of kids. And then by the time I fully get back to the workforce, my juniors who I used to report to me are now, they leapfrog me and now they're like my managers and I report to them. So I wonder whether or not that's something that you guys think about 
you know, with this, because if you're very career driven, that's like an ego, you know, pride issue as well, you know, where you're like, all right, I literally set my back, myself back for like several years before being able to like, you know, get back into the workforce. If we apply that whole kind of wisdom and like being mature and experienced to, to, to men and kind of, you know, I guess praise that, I think we should be doing the same for women, like women who've experienced both motherhood and career or had to put their career on pause for motherhood. But I don't think that's true sometimes, right? Like people go, oh, you've been out of the loop for too long. Um, you know, you're playing catch up and you know, you're a burden, you're not a... Yeah, well, I think it's it's the shift in perspective where it's like, well, you've got this whole experience of raising a child and I'm sure a lot of that can, you know, it, it's a different kind of experience that they might bring that someone younger who has an experience might not. Um, you know, if someone has only just known the corporate world and has an experience, family life will have a very different approach. So, yeah, I think it's just valuing, like, diversity of experience rather than just kind of making assumptions about who's going to be better, who's going to be more productive. Mm. It's like, it's not really about that. Well, what about this? Um, cause it's probably more relatable for you three cause you're younger. Um, and I see this as a boss and who's been on meetings with clients. Do you, how do you feel about you? Asian women traditionally look younger than their age. And then, um, you already being young, right? Like in your twenties, um, not being taken as seriously by people because you're like, oh, you're younger, you're inexperienced. Like it's, it's an, it's an implication. It's not a, someone saying that, but I could say the same thing and have a different result to you saying something, you know, and like literally tackling the same problem the same way, but not having the same success just because you're probably female and being Asian has an extra dynamic that you probably look younger than you are. Yeah, I, I have come from the experience of one, like you said, being Asian, but also being female, you don't get taken seriously. Whether or not it's now with clients, uh, I feel like, how do I put this? Like sometimes I feel like people don't, perceive me as someone who would have a lot of knowledge or have a lot of experience because of my age. But fortunately I like, I can get away with feeling more mature or coming off as a bit more mature than I am. But in my previous job or my previous role, I was at in a male dominated, dominated industry. And a lot of the times if I voiced anything, it was very much a boys club. Um, and if any serious issues came up and I voiced it to higher ups, they wouldn't take me seriously and nothing would be done about it. But whereas um, any other males in that job, I guess, um, they would be able to voice any of their opinions and get shit done or have their way. So I saw someone who was in one of the top roles for a very long time. She was in it for, I don't know, 10 years. And a lot of the time I saw a lot of the men that came in try and kick her out or try and get her fired no matter what. They would do all these sneaky things behind their back or make jokes about it in the staff room. But she was good at her job, but they just didn't take her seriously because it was a boys club. But I think, again, like a lot of Asian females just don't get taken seriously in general, uh, whether or not it's because we are perceived as obedient or um, more quiet and don't say much or have our say. And if we do have our say, I think it gets uh, misconstrued as um, being pushy. Yeah, or disrespectful, I guess. Yeah. 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 Do you have any advice on like what you should do and you should not do or maybe to make your life easier when it comes to those situations? Like what did that female um, uh, manager do? Like to, when did, she obviously knew that, you know, it was a boys club um, and she stayed and she kicked ass at what she did. Like what did she do? I think for her, she was at a stage where um, she was a lot more comfortable in her role. And so she wasn't actually able to be kicked out, I guess. But I've seen other females in the same uh, industry and they just have to be they have to put on a role that is way more serious and they can't joke around as much as everyone else can. Exactly. They have to be very mask um, in order to be taken seriously. And people do talk shit about them like, oh, she's too serious. She doesn't, she doesn't joke around. She why can't she take a joke? But at the end of the day, if she was joking around or making jokes or was a lot more um, feminine, she wouldn't be taken as seriously or people would walk all over them because you aren't as dominant in a male dominated field, for example. I don't know. I think over the years I have grown to find the security or the patience to be able to deal with that. But again, I'm fortunate enough to not have to be faced with, I guess, the corporate world of um, hierarchy or male dominated roles that, you know, you can't move up into either. Asian females as well have to feel like they have to put it on twice as hard um, to be able to be a little bit louder in the room. Um, I think even just from our experience with Level Asian, 
when I started, I didn't really know how to navigate around you guys, but I was also still trying to figure it out. Our boys club. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you guys gave me the space to be able to speak up. Um, in the very beginning, I just had no experience at all. Like that's, that's just what it was. And I just didn't know what to do. But over time, I kind of learned I have to speak up more or just interrupt essentially, if that's what I want to do. Um, people naturally talk over each other and that's just how it is. But again, reading the room and being able to understand who's talking over who and like you said, like personalities, right? Um, but again, fortunate enough to, whereas this environment is very, very different to how other people might have um, experiences in different jobs and different corporate roles or other roles, right? Yeah, like if I can add, just to be practical, um, and I think Jessica Wong Saunderson said this, she said, go look for someone who's either a mentor or someone who they call them sponsors, right? A very corporate term. But in other words, the way I inter interpret it is it could be a boss, it could be a colleague, it could be a manager, um, someone who's going to give you um, a lot of confidence. Because I think that's the biggest thing is that oftentimes, um, you know, and I'm not a female, so I'm just talking from, you know, my understanding is that uh, the a lot of this comes from like, hey, maybe not necessarily either believing in yourself or there's some sort of inner dialogue that says you're not good enough or there's, there's a whole multitude of reasons. And when you have someone, and it doesn't matter if it's a white, like a Caucasian male, older, you know, boss, right through to a young Asian female colleague, um, if you have someone who can come in and give you the confidence, I think it, it has a huge effect or impact on your belief in your ability. Because oftentimes I think we talk ourselves out of things before we even do it. Um, and so us as bosses, we try and give you that space um, because we're very cognizant of it, but I think there's a lot of bosses that are not. So then, you know, I think the main thing for me is like, you have to be practical. You shouldn't wait for things to come to you. You should go out and look for it. Um, and that means taking matter into your own hands, which means go seek out these things as opposed to waiting for it to come to you. Um, and I think the problem a lot of people have is they, you know, complain or have issues with this, but then they don't do anything about it as well. Um, so if you're in a fortunate circumstance, like maybe say you girls are, or how you feel like, I don't know if we're doing a good job or not. It seems like we are. Um, but if you're not, then you should go out and seek that out because that's the only way that you're going to get it. Otherwise it's, it's not going to happen. Right. Let's, let's be frank. It's the real world. It's not, it's, it's not, we're not playing in a, a sandbox here. And people aren't going to hand things to you either. Like it does, it does take courage to be able to step up and step out of your boundaries. And again, they always say you have to get uncomfortable to get comfortable. Right. And you have to put yourself into positions that are uncomfortable, like looking or asking for help, um, which is something that may feel really scary for some people. But once you do, maybe you get knocked back a few times or get rejected by people. And you might find that some people you connect with may not be the right person to mentor you as well or sponsor you. So it's, it's all about, like Can said, going out and finding your own way. Um, again, like you're carving your own path, essentially. If you if you want something, go get it. Do the things that you need to do to go get it. Yeah, nice. I think we've covered that pretty extensively. Yeah, um, that was a long wind. <laughs> we've had a lot of requests about uh, Asian beauty standards, yes. um, especially in the female space. Mm -hmm. um, I know obviously there's a lot of... I mean, look, it's already hard being a female and having a lot more <laughs> expectations around beauty. <laughs> Than, than men do, um, but specifically from an Asian lens, you know, there's a lot of kind of stereotypes that, um, or expectations in terms of beauty standards that are kind of, um, you know, in the media, for example, that are kind of setting that expectation. Um, do you guys feel any kind of pressure around having to conform to that or a particular kind of aesthetic or look? I think we'd have very different perspectives in this room at the moment because Kelsey you can speak from a mixed Asian race um, perspective and then Mish as well um, you've got like Korean background uh, I know that beauty centers there are completely insane insane yeah. Uh, Next level. yeah Kelsey do you want to touch on your experience um, I think with being mixed race there's that stigma already existing that oh you're like a exotic creature you look beautiful or whatever but um, for some like there's, there's like an idealized version of what you should look like as a mixed race person. Mm. And um, some people may feel like they don't fit that. And that in itself is a whole other bubble problem that we can get into. Um, I know in the Philippines, they actually favor lighter skin. Um, like if you look at the telesetters and the news anchors, like they modify their faces to look more Western and it's crazy. 
And a lot of the beauty products have bleach in them too. Oh, yeah. Whitening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Brightening. All of that. So this is a term called colorism. So if you're not familiar with, with what colorism is, it's different to racism. Colorism is discrimination based on essentially pigment in your skin, like how dark you are um, within, um, you know, minority communities. So not just Asian communities, but also, you know, black communities and, you know, Latina um, you know, communities as well. So... Yeah, I mean, I think, and it, it can be really damaging. It comes down to media representation and, you know, expectations around that and glorifying Caucasian features. Um, but I think it's also deeply rooted in, like, classism as well because it all comes back down to, like, the peasant class working in the fields and... Getting the sunlight. Yeah, all the time. getting all the sunlight because they're, you know, the, and then hence all the pigment in their skin. Um, yeah, and I think that's something that can be as small as microaggressions when you go back to the motherland and your, and your family's like, you've gotten so dark since I last saw you, you know, um, and that's probably because you like go to the beach and like enjoy playing sports outdoors. Mm-hmm. These are things that you can't really help. Um, but then it can get a bit more serious and damaging when um, it comes to things like relationships and favoritism around m- who you should marry, for example, what kind of class and how they look. Um yeah, and I think it's harder for women. I think it applies to to everyone, but I think women in particular, um, women who are darker in Asian communities, I think have it have a lot of struggles and challenges in that space as well. Beyond just you know your fair skin, skinny Asian woman. Yeah. So, any thoughts around you know have you guys had any experiences around colorism as well? Did you guys ever had any Asian like, uh, Did anyone ever say anything about your color? I don't know. Even if I did, it probably would have been young when I was younger, but also not something that I remember enough. I grew up in a more Caucasian dominated uh, region of New South Wales. <laughs> uh, so everyone had dark skin. Everyone was out in the sun playing, you know, tennis or sports on the, in the summer holidays. Um, and also growing up in Australia, it's a Western country. And so we've got beaches here and everyone favors when you are darker. The only th- and also my parents, have, our, our family is from southern China, so everyone is quite dark there too. And we come, come from a family of, you know, farmers and whatnot. So it's never really been a big issue for us. Um, yeah, what about you? Well, I kind of grew up in a fairly ethnic group, so I felt quite safe. It wasn't until I moved high schools into a more, how do I say it nicely, a very white area where I would get little indirect racist jabs right um i remember there was this one time i was in biology class and there was this drop kick and he was harassing one of the girls there and there was a group of us trying to like tell him to go away and i don't know what i said to him but something along the lines of like oh just leave her alone he turns around and he says to me shut up mexican (gasps) and i was like i'm not even mexican man (laughs) yeah far out it's just yeah like you said like little microaggressions based off of how you look and what people might perceive your culture to be based of your skin color or how you, mm. yeah. Yeah, I think there definitely needs to be a shift. I think it starts with like representation, firstly. Um, I think we need to see more people of color with more pigment, to be honest, in our media, um, in our movies, because I think, and not just movies, but like, you know, social media stars, basically in the media we consume because it kind of validates and normalizes that. Um, it makes it more acceptable. It makes people more acceptable. Um, you know, if we're not represented, in mass media, then we are, you know, more or less minorities within minorities. Mm. Um, and that's even harder. And I think that you kind of feel unheard and you kind of feel dismissed as well. And then you also feel shame. You know, there's a lot of shame around being darker within the Asian community. Um, and that's just, I mean, it's, you know, it's all based on something that you can't really help. Um, and then, you know, if you see the kind of rise of really dangerous um, trends like skin bleaching and things like mm. that in within communities, it's, you know, these practices really shouldn't exist if we can kind of just foster a culture of acceptance mm. rather than trying to meet a standard that isn't really fair. Well, then, Michelle, do you want to touch on um, your experiences being Korean? And also when you go back to Korea, I've heard all of the billboards and all the advertising is for lighter skin, for double eyelids, everything like that, being skinnier, fitting into a certain mold. I mean, I don't go back to Korea that often, but when we do travel, like Gangnam especially, which is kind of like um, like Sydney, it's like a really big city there. Like the, like a whole street would just be plastic surgery places. And like a lot of the Koreans, they're like, as soon as they like graduate high school, like it'll be really normal to just go back 
I mean, just to go to a plastic surgery place to get their double eyelids. It's like a graduation gift, right? Kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or it's like, you know, even just getting a haircut, like that's how normalized it is. Or I think even doing nose jobs these days and making sure you've got like the the V-line. And, you know, a lot of of the K-pop stars, like they've got like that V-line and they've got, you know, even the guys, they put on makeup as well. And like that being white, having that white looking skin is like, it, that's like their beauty standard. It's like kind of here where like a lot of the girls would go out to the beach to get tan. And that that that's that's glamorous. That's cool. That's attractive. Um, whereas in Korea, it's like everything's like you got to you got to look white. But then, but then the thing is, like you go there and everyone just looks the same. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> the they all go to the same surgeons. <laughs> it's like the same eyelids, the, the same type of makeup hairstyle and even just the way they dress and I felt like whenever I go there it's like there's no there's no variety there's no like everyone doesn't seem to have any kind of like their own unique identity it's just everybody is just following the crowd and I think a lot of the Asian 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 communities and Asian mindset is to kind of follow the crowd um so it, it's really hard to actually find people with monoliths it's it's you'd see more monolith uh, people with monoliths here, actually, like a lot of the Korean Australians here, they they had monoliths, and but yeah, a lot of them would just have it, and I think that's like the unique look to it. I think a lot of the Korean Australians as well, if you ask them, they'd be like, especially the guys, they're like, I actually like you know girls with monoliths and not with the the double eyelids. It it just looks more natural, yeah. So um, that was quite interesting, and I think a lot of the Korean Australians here are a lot more chill. Like they, they'd go out to the beaches, they'd get a tan. It doesn't really matter. Um, I, I know when they go back there, a lot of their grandparents would be like, "Oh, what happened to you? Like kind of like you you you're like a baked potato now." Like that, that's what they would say. But um, I think I like that mindset because everybody is just so they're more free. Whereas like the Koreans in Korea, they're just like everything's. A about the beauty, like external factors. And even when there's, I think they got rid of it now, but when they used to submit their resumes, um, they would put a photo and like their photo would be like completely like either photoshopped or be like their their look would be completely different because it's a lot of that. A lot of that is based on like the looks as well when they hire people. I think it's also because the economy there is like hyper competitive. Mm. That's why they feel like the pressure to look different or distinguished or more Western Mm. will set them apart from their competition as well. Yeah. It's like you have to look like this plus you need to have this kind of brains as well and you like you need to have all these different standards i think a lot of the korean guys like they get a lot of pressure for from for their height like you have to be like a certain height to be even like um considered attractive yeah Uh, over six feet (laughs) i got cat bombs um yeah i think it's interesting like in terms of East versus West in terms of, uh, you know, what we value. Um, because, you know, in Asia, we, a lot of the time, the culture, you know, uh, values more Caucasian or Western um, features. Whereas over here, you know, a lot of people go and get fake tans and actually want to look darker. And, you know, you also have celebrities, like really influential people like Ariana Grande and the Kardashians who all mm. profit. <laughs> mm. Of Asian, what is it? A- yeah, Asian, Asian fishing. fishing. Yeah, look, I mean, that's the specific Ariana Grande thing. Um, but you know, you have a lot of influencers and celebrities who, are ethnically Caucasian, um, profiting off looking more tanned. It's yeah. It's, it's also just, you know, certain trends that come up, um, that a lot of Asian females have had to deal with recently. Like for example, the fox eye trend where, uh, the conversation around it was, you know, we got made fun of a lot for having eyes that either slanted down or slanted backwards, but now it's become a trend in Hollywood and a lot of um, very influential models are going to get surgery where they literally sew, yeah, yeah, they sew a piece of string here into your temple and they pull it back into your hair. And so it brings everything back. It's the snatched look essentially. And Everyone was very angry about it because you guys made, it was this uh, conversation around, you guys made fun of us in school for having eyes like this, but now fast forward 10 years, 20 years, you're going, you're getting surgery to go get this look. So it is more Asian and more um, attainable in that sense. But when Asian females have it, it's, it's not as attractive. It's only attractive when it's become Western or uh, on a Caucasian model. (laughs) Yeah, but it is also just a trend as well. That's the other thing. It's like when you're having, when you're making decisions around surgery, um, 
you know, it, if you're kind of following trends, it's probably not the best way to approach it. And I think like, I'm not, not to shame anyone who's considered it or had surgery, but I think there's a, when it comes to Asian features, I think it, you know, obviously we want to kind of celebrate our own features and normalize it um, so that there's more of a culture of acceptance. You know, every, we all, you know, no matter the shape of your eyes or the color of your skin, I think the you know, more diversity and acceptance is always the healthier route because, you know, when you're making these decisions to, you know, have a monolid and change your features and change the, sh- change the shape of your nose, your the, the implications is also that you're erasing the Asian-ness in you to look more Caucasian. Um, and whether you want to do that by choice and you acknowledge that, that's totally up to you. I believe everyone's got their own freedom to look the way they want to, but there is a wider implication of like you are looking less like your relatives or your family. Um, you are denying parts of yourself that make you Asian inherently. Um, you know, you may still be, you know, feel like culturally you're Asian, but I think there's a wider implication and, and around, you know, and a lot of pressure around social media and, and things like that as well. I think for anybody who's young and considering these things, it's like, it's a big decision to kind of take these steps to conform. Whereas I think if we had more of an acceptance around our features, it wouldn't have the same pressure for people who are considering this. I, I The other side of it is, it is, easy to do one thing and say it and you know find security in yourself to be able to accept those features um but i know a lot of young females at the moment with the rise of social media they are trained to believe that they need to look a certain way or be a certain size in order to be uh considered somewhat the standard not even attractive just the standard uh especially young girls at the moment there's a big rise of young girls being on tiktok and constantly seeing you know influencers like charlie d'amelio or um bella hadid or kendall jenner and very very skinny models and that is i guess that's what's coming back into trend now and i think it's very dangerous for a lot of influencers to be promoting a certain thing and not showing the side of you know this is not reality uh, and it alters the brain a little bit. And when you are raised in that environment, that is just what you're used to. You don't actually know what normal looks like anymore. But yeah, I think I think we have a big responsibility as a society to make sure young women feel like they can be themselves and not have to resort to surgery or um, constantly being on diets um, or looking like a certain person in Hollywood or K-pop. And whatnot. I think it's also like sometimes the parents as well. Like, um, like I think there was a conversation about like you know parents would they would feed you and then like they'd be like, why are you so fat? Yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, just yeah. Like, <laughs> what do you want me to do about that? Like, you know. So sometimes the parents' influence can kind of come into it too. Like if they keep on telling you like why are you so dark or like you know um, about your features, I think that kind of like. Um, it impacts you quite negatively mm. yeah but I, I personally i would uh, if i could add it's also from comes from within it's your confidence and like for me the most pretty thing about a girl and what makes her beautiful is her confidence like you know if she's confident in the way that she is like you know she steps out and she's confident and, about she, owns it. and she owns it she, you, you really can see that and that's more empowering than uh, that's more beautiful for me um than you know any type of plastic surgery or double eyelid or whatever it is or more big boobs or ass or anything like that <laughs> like it's seriously it's the confidence for me oh well the parent thing really quick just my last bit was um uh it's if you're going to trace it all the way back i think a lot of um people feel pressure now to look a certain ways because they haven't been given the confidence by parents so i think as parents you know and you know we'll go into this another day is um like all all like one of the basic needs of i think kids and people is just acceptance and like to be like authentically yourself and the problem is is that societies can be quite toxic and doesn't accept you for how you look or who you are so i think it starts with the family environment um if if your family environment accepts you and doesn't give you sort of some innate pressure whether it's intentional or non-intentional then you know i think you I've, i've seen people who are very confident like what davey's talking about females who they don't care. They're just like, they're like, this is me and this is who I am. And um, that's very attractive. I agree. Um, so yeah, I think it's a lot of that as well around confidence. I think it can come from friends as well. Like at least for me personally growing up, I was around a lot of um, women who are European. So they had that natural, beautiful, like hourglass figure. And then there's poor little me, 13, 12 years old, like a stick. <laughs> like puberty hadn't kicked in yet. 
and I'm just looking around at all these girls like, okay, what, when's it my turn, you know? Um, yeah, it's, it can be damaging at that age. You know? um, I would try to exercise to grow muscles in certain areas and yeah, it just was not pretty. <laughs> I, I think the struggle is kids, like when you're a kid or a young person, you don't really know what's on the other side. Yeah. So if you just realize you were like, right, in puberty's gonna hit at some stage, um, you know, I am gonna, I'm gonna be okay. Like if you just had some sort of lens to look into the future, um, I think you wouldn't be feeling as much pressure as you would probably in that case, right? Um, and I, I feel like it still goes back to confidence. It's like your parents having to give you the confidence to go, it's fine, it's all gonna be okay. Um, you know, but again, I'm not female, so yeah. very hard to, for us to say. Um, but, you know, just taking us, we have, guys have their own insecurities. And, um, like about being short, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and um, yeah, I, I just feel like it's one of those things where, yeah, we, we, we dealt with the same problems as well in different ways. And um, not to, you know, deny anyone their experience. It's just like, yeah, it's, as, it's not as big of a deal as you think, you know, at the end of the day, you know. Mm. Yeah, so I think it comes down to um, surrounding yourself with positive people and accepting people. Yes. Um, if your family can't provide that, then at least your friends who you can choose, um, you know. And yeah, I think, you know, switching off, I think, you know, the media you consume, if it's not giving you positive, um, you know, perspective around your how you look, um, switch it off. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, obviously parents and, and the people you're with. But um, yeah, I think I think there's progress. I think society just... I think it's worth having these discussions and I think, um, you know, if we can kind of work towards changing society to at least get to a stage where we're all a bit more accepting of each other. Or at least our own minds. At least in your own way. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think, you know, it's, it's all for the better really. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good place to wrap up. Um, we uncovered and unpacked a lot of topics and discussions, uh, went through a different, I guess, different routes as well. We were covered, career, uh, motherhood, beauty standards, all of that. Um, but there will be more of these episodes. So make sure if you want to talk about different, if you want us to talk about different topics, make sure you DM us, uh, on our Instagram at level Asian pod. Thank you. See ya. Bye. Thanks for listening to the level Asian podcast solo episodes. If you enjoyed this one, please support us by giving us five stars or sharing it with your friends and family who might enjoy it too. If you have any topics that you would like us to cover, please DM us on Instagram at level Asian pod. Also don't forget to head on over to level Asian podcast.com to join our email list and receive the latest updates and get notified on when the next episode drops. Catch you on the next episode.